Well, good morning, WCAG. How are you guys doing this morning? Good, good. All right. Are we ready to jump into the Word of God together? Yeah, excellent. We want to welcome those that are joining us online, WCAG online, those that are uh, with us today. We want to welcome you. A lot of exciting things happening, guys, across all of our campuses. Uh, today um, in Fairview, Montana, they are actually having service in their new sanctuary uh, that was built. We're excited for them. Our Belfield campus, uh, I was on vacation this last week, drove through Belfield late last night. All the walls are framed up at the church in Belfield. They can't wait to get into uh, their new facility. It's going great. Uh, Kenmere right now, uh, you notice that Pastor John uh, wasn't with us this morning. He is campus pastor at Kenmere for the day because Pastor Chris is taking the team to Estonia. So Pastor John and Naomi, they have the best up there in Kenmere to take care of them while Pastor Chris is gone. And so a lot of exciting things uh, that are happening, guys, across all of our campuses. We're jumping back into the book of Acts. We're almost done, guys. It's taken us four summers to make it through the book of Acts. Any Bibles out there this morning? You guys got some Bibles? All right, very good, very good. Let's turn to Acts chapter 28 uh, this morning, the final chapter in the book of Acts. It's going to start today. Last week we left you off. Pastor John uh, was talking to you guys in, in the middle of the storms, terrible storm. The ship broke up. Everyone ends up in the water. Everyone either grabs a plank or a piece of debris or swims for the shore. They end up on the shore of the island of Malta. Thankfully, God told Paul uh, that he came to him and said, listen, no one is going to lose their life in this terrible uh, shipwreck. And so no one lost their life. They all end up uh, sputtering up onto the beach in Acts chapter 28, and that's where we take off today. So if you have your Bible this morning, we're going to be in Acts chapter 28. Uh, for those of you that are online, it'll be on the bottom of your screen here in Watford City. It'll be on the screen behind us. We're going to be in the New Living Translation, but this morning we're going to need a lot of translations, so hopefully you guys brought some new King James. We could use an old King James. We could use an NIV this morning, so you guys will see as we go uh, that we're going to need those translations today. Let's start in Acts chapter 28. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. It says this, once we were safe on shore, we learned that we were on the island of Malta. The people of the island were very kind to us. It was cold and rainy, so they built a fire on the shore to welcome us. Now here we see that the local inhabitants of the island of Malta, some translations say barbarians, that these people were barbarians, and that sounds kind of scary, like we rolled up on the island here and we met a bunch of barbarians, but that was actually a word that was translated, the original Greek was actually barbarians, but it was those people who did not share the language of Greek or Rome, so they were called this generic group of people called barbarians. Uh, it was not meant to be a negative term, it was just to understand that they did not speak uh, the, the Greece language or uh, the, the uh, language of Rome, but they were very gracious, these people. Uh, when they saw this group of uh, people that the ship broke up, they ended up on the shore, they began lighting a large bonfire to help them keep warm and dry off all of the survivors, over 200 people that were coming out of the water wet and cold at that time. It's late in the fall, it's very cold water. And so uh, they're, they're all trying to get everyone warmed up here on the beach. Starting at verse 3, it says, As Paul gathered an armful of sticks and was laying them on the fire, a poisonous snake driven out by the heat bit him on the hand, and the people of the island saw it hanging from his hand and said to each other, A murderer, no doubt, though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. But Paul shook off the snake into the fire and was unharmed. So we see here Paul helping everybody out. He goes out to find a bundle of sticks, gets a bundle of sticks in his arm. Unbeknownst to him, there was a poisonous viper in the bundle of sticks. As he set the bundle of sticks on the big fire, the viper arose aw 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 from its, uh, um, its cold-blooded uh, hibernation, basically, jumps out of the sticks, latches onto Paul's hand, and we see that uh, he's got this poisonous snake hanging from his hand. And at this time, at that time in Roman folklore, there was actually 
a story about a fugitive that escaped a shipwreck but was soon killed later on by a viper. So these people immediately go, oh, it's like the story that we've always heard. This guy, he, he makes it through the shipwreck, but ultimately he dies by the bite of a viper. And then in verse 4, it actually says that though he escaped the sea, justice will not permit him to live. Anybody in your Bible this morning that the justice is capitalized? Look in your Bible real close there. The J on justice is capitalized. Anybody in your translations? Yeah, we got a couple. Uh, usually in the NIV, it's, it's highlighted as uh, uh, uppercase, which meant it's the name of someone. And in the, that region of Malta, they worshiped a goddess. Her name was Justice. And so we think justice being, well, justice is prevailing here. He's getting what's coming to him, kind of like some sort of karma or something like that. But in reality, they were actually saying, our goddess Justa, Justice is evening the scales here, and he, may, he must be a criminal of some kind because he made it through the sea, but ultimately justice is going to prevail, and he is going to die by this poisonous viper. So the people see that this has happened. And Luke uses, uh, Luke here is the writer of the book of Acts. He's also the writer of the book of Luke. And he is actually by trade a physician or a doctor. And so he uses oftentimes different language than other gospel writers would use. And he uses a lot of technical language. For instance, if we remember a couple weeks ago, he used a lot of technical sailing language of where they were going and different things like that. Here he uses actually some medical language of the Greek word for viper here means a poisonous snake. So he was very vivid and very clear saying that this wasn't just an average snake that was mad that bit him, but this was actually a, a viper, a very poisonous snake. And when Paul shook the snake off into the fire, then it says everyone was looking at him. They were all gathered around the fire. Everyone was looking, okay, what's going to happen here? This guy just got bit by a really poisonous snake. And then in Acts chapter 28, verse 6, it says, the people People waited for Paul or waited for him to swell up or suddenly drop dead. But when they had waited a long time and saw that he was not harmed, they changed their mind and decided that he was a god. So obviously, all of the people are gathered around the fire. This is where everyone is getting warm, and they see this whole thing that has happened, and Paul has been struck by the viper. They're waiting for him to die, to swell up. This is another term only, you, uh, or excuse me, only Luke uses this term, to swell up. It's a medical term. Here, it's not found anywhere else in the New Testament, this Greek word to swell up. And he uses this to say, hey, this was a very serious thing that was going to happen if this snake bit uh, Paul. And so Paul, he doesn't die. And when the people recognize that he doesn't die, they go, oh man, this guy, he is actually uh, a god, like a deity type person. Similarly, this happened earlier in the book of Acts in Acts chapter 14, where Paul and Barnabas did a miracle by the power of God, and then were uh, kind of deemed Hermes and Zeus, and they were, and people tried to worship them. But w whenever guys, mankind sees something supernatural, they want to explain it away in some way. So before Paul can even explain what had happened here, they all of a sudden they're start calling him a deity, and they're saying this deity has visited us in bodily form. But this wasn't the only thing that they were going to see that was supernatural on the island. In fact, in a few verses, we see there's a lot of cool things that begin happening because Paul and the power of the Holy Spirit have shown up. So we see God is moving on the island of Malta here in just the next few verses. Verse 7 and 8, it says, Near the shore where we landed was an estate belonging to Publius, the chief officer or the chief official of the island. He welcomed us and treated us kindly there for three days. As it happened, Publius' father was ill with fever and dysentery. Paul went in and prayed for him, and laying his hands on him, he healed him. So Paul and his group, they were welcomed into Publius' house um, so they could get some long-term accommodations. That's a lot of people. He was going to uh, provide for their needs for the next few days in order to get them something else. And then in his home, uh, uh, Publius 
Jesus' father was sick. It was his father, yep. His father was very sick with multiple fevers. Now, Malta was known for its fevers because they would get these microbes in the goat's milk on the island of Malta because they didn't have refrigeration and different things like that. I know I went way too far there, but I read it in a commentary. I thought I'd share it with you guys. Anyways, dysentery and fever were common on the island of Malta, and people would actually die. It was very life-threatening when they would get uh, this sickness of dysentery and fever. So it was dangerous, it was life-threatening, and this guy was getting multiple fevers. Paul goes into his room, lays hands on him, and prays for the man, and the man becomes healed. And God was opening a door for some incredibly miraculous things to begin to happen on the island of Malta. Jesus, in Mark chapter 16, tells us that these are the signs that will accompany those people who are empowered by the Holy Spirit. In Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18, I want to see if you guys can recognize some of these things in the life of Paul. It says, these are the miraculous signs that will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new tongues. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink any, anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick, and they will be healed. So we see here, throughout Paul's ministry, we see many of these things, if not all of them, fulfilled uh, in this prophetic word that Jesus was given about the early church. Paul here, uh, we see cast out demons in earlier passages in Acts. We see that he spoke in tongues. Uh, he, kept, he was kept safe from the poisonous snake, that it didn't hurt him. We see Paul laying hands on the sick, and they are healed. And then we see in verse 28, or excuse me, in chapter 28, verse 9, this is what begins to happen on the island of Malta. It says, then all the other sick people on the island came and were healed. So word begins to spread throughout the island. Now this doesn't mean that they all showed up at, at once and then it, then it happened. It could have been uh, periodically, every other day, someone would come, a new person, and Paul would pray for them and they would be healed. And over the course of the next few months, all of the people on the island that were sick were now getting healed because they were praying uh, for them. Now guys, one of the things here at WCAG we believe is that if it happened in this book, it could happen today. How many believe that? If it happened in the Bible, it can happen today. We believe that wholeheartedly. So if something like this were to happen on the island of Malta, that means that it can happen today in America, uh, wherever we're at, we're believing in this time frame that God can also do it. Because here's the thing, guys, nowhere in this Bible does it say that all of a sudden at the end of the book here, the last book of, or the last verse of Revelation, that God somehow lost all of his power, had no ability to do the things that he was doing, and, and, and that all of these things stopped. There's nowhere the Bible says that, but it's a continuation. We see that we should be living out what God has called us to be, just like the early church. The early church was not just some sort of uh, thing that we were shooting for. We were supposed to live an empowered life. That's why the the mission statement of WCAG is we want to empower spirit-led disciples to change our world. We believe that the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is real and it is for today. And so we see that at, at the at, here uh, this morning, uh, we want to take some time to pray for people who, who are sick. We believe that God can heal people uh, who are sick when we lay our hands on them and we pray for them. And so Paul lays his hands on these people and they are healed. So at the close of the message this morning, I'm giving you ample warning here, we're not going to force anyone to do anything. So if you're a little on edge already, and you're like, oh no, okay. And by the way, we're not pulling any snakes out or anything like that. That was part of the passage, but we're not going to do that, okay. Um, so just setting you at ease. But you know what? We will, according to the scripture, they laid their hands on the sick and the people were healed. Okay, and so we're going to do that at the close of the service, and it, it's going to be your choice. If you would like to be prayed for, we're going to pray for you. But this morning, guys, I want to go through four things about healing, just real quick, uh, about healing and, and the importance of not just healing, but things that we need to remember about healing as we're talking about this. The first one is this. Number one, if you're taking notes, there's going to be four of them. Number one, healing is God's nature. So healing is a part of the character of God. We see in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, 
when he was talking to his people as he was leading them out of Egypt, he said, if you're willing to listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, obeying his commands and keeping all of his decrees, then I will not make you suffer any of the diseases I sent on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Basically, he was saying, I am Jehovah Raphi, the Lord who heals, or the Lord who is the physician, who is your physician. It says in Psalm 103, verse 3, it tells us that he, being God, he forgives all of my sins and he heals all of my diseases. So that means that there is no disease that can stand up to God. There is no disease that God cannot heal. That healing is found not only in his name, but healing is actually God's nature. So that's the first thing. Healing is God's nature. The second one is this. Healing is provided through Jesus Christ. So this is, really, this is really great. In Matthew chapter 8, verses uh, 16 and 17, it says that every, uh, every evening many demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. He cast out the evil spirits with a simple command, and he healed all the sick. This fulfilled the word of the Lord through the prophet Isaiah, who said, he took our sicknesses and he removed our diseases. This was a prophetic word that was spoken of the Messiah, that Jesus would come not just to cure people of the sickness of their soul, but also to heal them physically in their body as well. It says that by the stripes that were put on Jesus' back, we are healed. Jesus Christ, his ministry was one of healing. And because Jesus continues to live today, we serve a risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Healing is provided through Jesus, even for today. The third thing is, healing is available to us today. So that was part of what we were just talking about. Not only did Jesus say that these signs would follow uh, the early church, that they would lay their hands on people and they would recover, but also James writes that in the process of, of church, we are to pray for people for them to be healed. In James chapter 5, verse 14, it says, Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick and the Lord will make you well. And if you've committed any sins, you'll be forgiven. So James was talking about the early church. He says, listen, the early church, that a person didn't necessarily have to come to church, didn't have to come to a temple, didn't have to come uh, to the tabernacle or anything, but actually we as empowered, uh, empowered spirit-led disciples could go and lay hands on people and, and they could be healed. So that would mean that if you are at home, if you're at your workplace, wherever you're at, the power of Jesus can be there for healing. So in James chapter 5, verse 14, it says, call, call for those to come, pray, and lay hands on you, anoint you with oil, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So James writes this to the early church. Now, there is an aspect about here. It says, such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick. Now, here is kind of a doctrinal um, uh, error that, that some people think. Oftentimes, when you pray and someone isn't healed, they will say, or you'll hear someone say, well, that person didn't have enough faith. Oh, you guys have heard that too, right? Someone will say that. It's almost like, well, we gotta get God out of a corner because he didn't answer this prayer, therefore, we, it's gotta be something that we're doing wrong, so therefore, we see that, that people will oftentimes try and credit it as faith. It's saying the faith uh, um, will, will somehow make this happen. Now, guys, I just want to explain very clearly that faith is not a way that we can manipulate God. Let's get that really clear. We can't just say like, oh, this is, well, A squared plus B squared equals, if we add enough, a, if you add enough faith and you do this right and you cross your fingers and then you lay your hands on somebody, then all of a sudden God has to do it. You see, God is the one who heals Therefore, we're the one. So the question then becomes, well, Pastor Sheldon, if faith is a part of this healing, a prayer offered in faith, then faith plays a part. Actually, faith does play a part. Here's the thing. When we read in the Bible, there was actually a time where Jesus didn't do many miracles, the Bible says, because there was a lack of faith in that region. 
But then we see in other places, like Malta here, for instance, when people start hearing and their faith begins to grow, then many miracles are happening in this place. And so we see that there was, that with a lack of faith, there weren't as many miracles. With a growth of faith, there were more miracles. So how much faith do you need to be healed? I'm going to tell you the secret. You have to have enough faith to ask. That's how much you need. You have to have enough faith to ask. If you have that much, the Bible says that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. You think about how much faith does it take in order for a person to be healed? You got to have enough faith to actually ask God, to actually come before him and say, God, I believe that you can heal me. I believe that, that when we lay hands on, on people, we're believing that, that you can, can heal them. But ultimately, we leave, the, we leave the outcome in God's hands. But we have the amount of faith to say, okay, God, I believe enough to pray. I believe enough to ask someone else to pray for me. Whatever it is, that's enough faith. Guys, can I share a couple of stories that could build your faith this morning of things that God has done, even just recently? And, you know, in the last few months, we've had some pretty serious um, bad diagnoses of cancer, things where doctors said, um, you need to get your house in order, uh, people are going to die. We had a stage four cancer where the doctor said this person will not live beyond two more years, and, and it, was, it was a very sad situation, and we prayed uh, for that person, laid hands on them. They went back to the doctor, and the doctor was kind of like, okay, we're going to get all these things in order, but he says, we're going to take one more scan. He took one more scan, and he came back in, and he said, I don't know what just happened. He said, the last time we scanned him, he was full of cancer. He was not going to last two years. He said, now we scanned him, and he's completely cancer-free. It is a miracle. It's a miracle. And we had multiple people that they've given them terrible diagnosis, and, and we said, okay, well, we're going to pray. We're going to believe God, and we anoint people with oil. We lay hands on them. We believe that God's going to heal them. They come back, and the doctor's like, you know what? I think we made a mistake. The machine must not have been working or something like that. And, or many times the doctor will say, you know what? It is a miracle. It's a miracle. And Guys, we have prayed a couple different times for babies that there were things going on in the womb where the doctors would say the baby's in jeopardy because there's certain things that are happening. Maybe there's a deformity or things like that. And we just prayed and we said, God, we, we pray for, for a, a clean bill of health for that child that, that it, the mom would carry them full term and they, the baby would be okay. And then all of a sudden, the doctor's saying, no, it's not gonna be very good. And then all of a sudden, the baby comes out and the doctor goes, well, that, didn't, that doesn't look right on the scan right here a day ago, it looked like this was going to be happening, but then the baby came out completely perfect. And he said, it's a miracle. Our carpet layer, James, I don't know if James is here today or not, I'm going to tell on him and brag on God here, but James was laying the carpet in the basement of the church, does an amazing job. If you need some carpet done, go find James, okay? James was getting carpet laid in the church and something happened that he tore and ruptured his lung and it ripped a hole in his lung. And the doctors, he went into emergency and they were extremely, they were extremely concerned that he might bleed out and die. And uh, so they said, you gotta be, you know, you're completely bedridden, you gotta, and so James, we, we just laid hands on James and we prayed for him that God would heal him. And so the doctor said, we need you to come back in, in about four days, and we need to redo uh, um, the, the scan in order to figure out what our next step is in sewing up the, the tear in your lung. And so he goes back four days later, walks into the doctor's office, they rescan him, they said, we, do, we cannot figure it out. I said, this is what the scan looked like on Monday. Here on Friday, this is what happened. He said, your hole, is completely, your hole is completely closed up. You don't need any surgery or anything. It's a miracle. So guys, here's the thing. God can do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine because he's God. And all it takes is our ability to have enough faith to say, God, 
I believe that you can do this. But here's the thing that I, that sometimes we struggle with. Sometimes we think it has to get so bad that the only other answer is God. That's where we feel like before we start praying for stuff. But you know what? God heals shoulders and God heals acne and God heals anxiety and God heals ligament damage and God heals emotional trauma and God heals addictions and God heals eyesight that is kind of blurry and God heals headaches that come on and off and God heals allergies and God heals sprained ankles and all of these things that sometimes God heals ingrown toenails, whatever it is, that you're sitting here going, well, that's just too, you know, it's too small. It's too, it's not a big enough thing that, that man, I gotta, have, I gotta have this terrible thing that's going on that there's no other answer, but then God comes through. It's this incredible, miraculous thing. But you know what, guys? It says that, that all of the people who were sick and came to Paul and Paul began laying hands on them, they were healed. It doesn't list all of the things that, they were healed from, but, but we know that probably not everybody was a life-threatening type situation, but that there was just simply enough faith to say, God, I'm gonna give these things to you. And so you know what, guys, here's the thing. If you're in the room today and you're struggling with stuff, maybe you're going, you know what? The doctor's been giving me medications and I can't get my medications right and it's causing a lot of different things happening in my body. You know what, God can heal that today. And you can have things like, stomach problems where you go, man, if I eat certain things, it really causes my stomach to have issues and, 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 and it's debilitating at times. You say, you know what? God can heal that. It's not just like certain huge things. So this morning, we want to pray for any and everything that anyone in the room would even have today. Last, that service, we got out late because we prayed, we probably prayed for, Pastor Dustin, how many at least over 50 easy uh, people and all kinds of things that God, we just said, you know what? We're just gonna believe God for whatever is happening in the room today and we're believing that God can heal them. So we get down to the last point about healing that's really important. It's why does God heal? That's the question we need to ask. Why does God heal? It's because God wants to make me happy, Right? There's a couple of people going, no, no, I got fooled by that one last week or whatever type of thing. <laughs> hey, you know what? I'm, I'm going to break it to you. It isn't because God wants to make you happy. That's really not. In fact, God, because happiness is situational, if God heals you, you might get happy. That might be good, right? But in reality, God is more concerned about joy. In fact, one of the byproducts of the Holy Spirit, one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is joy. And the reason why a person should chase rather after joy than happiness is because happiness is dependent upon situations where joy is dependent upon God. That means that whatever situation you find yourself in in your life, you can still retain joy even in the midst of the most challenging circumstances of your life because God is the giver of joy where happiness is given through situations and circumstances. But you know what, guys? When we think about this, and I kind of diverted off, the question, why does God heal? Why does God heal? Is healing displays God's power and his love. Healing displays God's power and his love. You see, guys, God is in a constant state of showing himself to be real because he desperately wants a relationship with each one of us. And why is that? It's because God loves each one of us with an everlasting love. And he wants to display his power and his love to us. So let's close up our last verse in our passage this morning. It's verse 10. It says, after all of these people were healed and they prayed for them, it says, as a result, they were showered with honors. And when the time came to sail, people supplied us with everything that we needed for the ship. We could see that here, God had moved in a powerful way in the island of Malta. And it's believed even to this day that there is a rich heritage that can actually be traced back to Paul coming to Malta. That by Paul, the church was planted and on this island as an early, um, early church. 
And so guys, each summer as we go through um, a passage in Acts, we get to the point where we say, how do we apply this to our life moving forward? Well, today I would just say that what we want to do and we want to apply is we simply want to apply and be obedient to praying for people who need healing this morning. And so today, guys, as we're getting in, we're going to have our worship team come at this time. And if we could have our prayer teams come at this time, we're going to do things a little different. That's kind of a, how we roll around here at WCAG. And today we're going to have uh, prayer teams up at the front. And I'm going to ask you, instead of waiting for someone to be available on the prayer teams, today we want to pray for as many people as we possibly can uh, to be healed. And uh, we're going to ask you that you would just line up down the rows uh, of the three rows here, and then when you're available, you can go to the next person to be prayed for today. And so we're going to have Mike, Pastor Dustin, uh, Thad and Luana, and then myself over here, and we're going to pray for you. And we've got oil this morning. I'm going to explain this a little bit. Guys, there's nothing magical in this little tube here, okay? I want you to understand that really clear. It's simply what the Bible tells us to do is to anoint people with oil and then lay hands on them. And the prayer of faith, which is us asking, how much faith do you need? You need enough to ask, right? So that we're going to believe that God can touch and heal you regardless of what it is. So oftentimes, they'll just take the oil and dip it like this, have a little bit of oil on their finger. They'll either anoint it on your forehead or on your hand, depending on what, what is going on in the situation. But we're going to believe that God can touch people in a physical way this morning. What I'm gonna ask of everyone, if you're here today and you'd say, Pastor Sheldon, I'm doing great physically, 100%. Everything is great. My life is perfect. That's, that's good. I'm happy for you. That's great. But here's the thing. What we're gonna do is we're gonna have the worship team. They're gonna worship this morning. And I would encourage you to, to participate in the closing part of this. Whether you need prayer or not, you can be a participant. Because what you're doing is you are participating in in ushering in the presence of Jesus. And so you're participating by worshiping God, by singing, by maybe praying for those that are in the line. You just say, Lord, touch them. And we're just believing that God can touch people. We just say, you know what, God? Uh, we pray and you do it. It's your, your thing. And so regardless, across this entire room, we prayed for people with cancer this morning, believing that God could heal them. We prayed for other people that just had something very simple, stomach ache, headache, allergies, whatever it was. But we prayed believing that God was going to touch them in a powerful way. And so across the room today, I'm going to ask everyone to stand to your feet at this time. And if you'd like to be prayed for, is that when the worship team comes in just a moment, we're going to ask you to begin lining up and we're just going to pray. But there was one last thing that I want to share with you guys today. As I was praying in preparation for the service today, I just really felt like God spoke to my heart that we weren't supposed to pray for people today, just pray for healing. But when we got done praying for healing, we were supposed to offer a blessing of health over those people so that God would bless you with health and strength to accomplish the mission and the purpose that he has for your life. So when our prayers are done for, for the specific situation or the circumstance that you're in right now, then they're gonna offer that prayer of blessing and they're gonna speak blessing over your health over your strength so that you can accomplish the things that God has called you to do. I'm gonna pray before we get started and then we're gonna jump right into that, okay guys? So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, right now, we know, Lord Jesus, that God, we're doing what your word tells us to do. And so, like the book of James, uh, we've gathered here uh, the prayer of faith. We're believing, Lord, we're gonna anoint people with oil, we're gonna do all the things that you ask us to do. And God, we're just asking, Lord, today, in a simple way, by faith, that God, you would do the things that only you can do, that you would bring healing and wholeness, that God, you would touch people at the deepest places of their physical body, of their emotional being, God, of their spiritual existence, God, that you would reach in and do the things that man can't do, that we would proclaim once again that it has been a miracle because God has touched them. And so, God, today we pray for those things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.